Okay. I want to do like, uh, can I do this? Oh. I want to take a video. Uh, <laughs> Alright, come on, we'll do a selfie. Okay. Look at this guy. <laughs> you want to take a video with me? Come on. You want to get another one? Yeah, no, here we are. I got the photo. Because <laughs> we are a media company. Yes, you are. There we go. <laughs> Please take your seats. We are about to begin. Ready? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Michigan Chronicles uh, Season 12, Pancakes and Politics. This, thank you. This is our last forum for the year. It's a little bittersweet because some of you I probably won't see the next year, but I definitely hope you do join us next year. And I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for participating this year. I hope you enjoyed it. We are ending very, very strong with the CEO Outlook. Um, we have with us today CEOs from, from, from some of our region's leading corporations. They'll be introduced in a little bit. Right now, without further ado, I'm going to bring to the stage uh, one of our hosts for the day, which is uh, Dennis Archer Jr., who is the CEO of Archer Corporate Services. We also have with us today, facilitating the conversation, Carol King, who is the host of Michigan Matters on CBS 62. Please give him a round of applause. Good morning. Carol, are you here somewhere? Here. All right, special good morning to Carol. I'm doing well. Thanks for allowing me to join you for the second time this year. I uh, look forward to having a good time this morning. Uh, I'm again flattered and honored to have been invited by Hiram and his team uh, and to join Carol uh, in moderating this morning's session. I'm excited about our guests, but right now my sole responsibility is to introduce uh, a dear friend of mine, Mr. Hiram Jackson. Uh, who some of you may have heard this before that I've known I think since fifth grade or so uh, when he was a star I think it was HMS Pinafore he had hair and he was uh, <laughs> had a lot more uh, muscle mass around his shoulders from playing football but uh, he's still the same Hiram and I'm very proud of his success with this business Hiram good morning you can always tell when the big dogs are in the house, right? Bring more big dogs, right? <laughs> this is our last one. I'm sad. No more waking up this early. I usually, I usually get 30 minutes less sleep during pancakes and politics season. But um, I get to take my kids to school. That's always a good thing, right? Uh, I want to start off by just by thanking you. I mean, this has been... 12th season, sold out, great people, tri-county area, folks from all over the state of Michigan coming downtown Detroit to talk about the wonderful things that are happening and the not so wonderful things. So please give yourselves a round of applause. <clears throat> you know, t today's, today's Pancakes and Politics is really why we started this 12 years ago. Um, we just thought that it was important that people from all geographic areas in Michigan, people of all races, age groups, social eco economic levels come together and really talk about what's going on in our city. Um, we wanted to have a voice in the dialogue with the folks who are the decision makers. And today we have some real decision makers. There are not many things that happen in this town without one of these four individuals having some input in it. 
so this CEO outlook, we've done it for the last three or four years. It's really an important part of what we do here at Pancakes and Politics because it gives you an opportunity to participate in the discussion and have some input in the discussion and listen to you know, how they make decisions. So I really want to thank our panelists today uh, for participating in this. It really goes to show uh, you know, how they view pancakes and politics, and we're, we're really pleased to have them. I want to thank Carol Kane, just Carol. Thank you, Carol. Uh, Dennis Archer and Vicki Thomas, uh, they've really helped us step up the content of pancakes and politics. I want to thank WWJ and CBS TV and Cranes for being our media partners. And um, not, not only the folks who have been sponsors, uh, but really the companies that have consistently bought tables at Pancakes and Politics that have really helped to sell us out. I want to give them a round of applause because I rarely get an opportunity to mention them. I want to thank the Michigan Chronicle staff. I get a chance to come up here and act like I really did some work. Um, but they were here early this morning and worked throughout the year to make sure that you have a pleasant experience. I want to thank all of them, especially Olga Hill. She gets a special thank you because she gets, she gets yelled at every now and then. <laughs> so I really want to say thank you, Olga, and I'm sorry, but I really do love you and you do a wonderful job. She's right here. Oh, there she is. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm going to bring up a very good friend of mine, Mr. Rick DeVore. You guys have known we have a great bromance going on. <laughs> uh, PNC has really stepped up over the last several years to make this a tremendous, tremendous event. And um, without further ado, Mr. Rick DeVore, President PNC Bank. Good morning. Um, one of the pillars um, of the Mackinac Policy Conference is civility in politics. And one of the things I've enjoyed over the years is we can have a conversation in this room and be civil about it even if we all walk out and agree to disagree. And I think that's a testament to the staff of the Michigan Chronicle and Hiram Jackson. Yesterday we saw the lack of civility in politics in Washington, D.C. And I know there's a number of uh, ministers and preachers in the room. And so I was hoping um, that we could uh, take a moment um, for them that were uh, victims of this. One of our employees, Megan Micah's brother, is uh, Matthew Micah, who's in uh, critical condition at this time in DC. So if we could just take a, a moment of silence, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, now I'm going to do the thing that I love to do at season in the fourth installment and announce that yesterday uh, for PNC staff, be pretty excited. Uh, Hiram Jackson and I came to agreement again to be the lead sponsor of Pancakes and Politics. So I want to thank the Michigan Chronicle. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn this program over to back to Dennis Archer. Thank you very much. I am not Dennis Archer, <laughs> just in case you can't tell. All right, there are a couple of th housekeeping things that I forgot to do. Uh, first of all, we're, we're, we're back with our polling, so pull out your phones. Everybody pull out your phones, please. We're going to be doing a couple of live polls here. And um, also, we're going to be on Facebook Live, so as I always say, if you're supposed to be someplace else, Duck and dodge. Um, so the way to participate with the polling is we're going to text pancakes, text pancakes to 22333. Text pancakes, P A N C A K E S, to 22333. And that will register you to participate. Our Facebook Live guest tweeter is Rochelle Riley. Rochelle, are you here? 
Stand up, Rochelle. Thank you for coming. She's our guest tweeter. And uh, the Twitter handle is hashtag Pancakes and Politics 2017. Again, we're streaming live. And um, before I sit down, I want to give my final season thank you to our sponsors. Thank you, Comcast, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Chase, FCA, Quicken Loans, St. John Providence Health Systems, and UHY Advisors, and HAP and Henry Ford. So thank you again. Text Pancakes to 22333. Uh, we've been doing really well online with this, so I want to bring back Dennis Archer. Thank you. I am not Hiram Jackson. <clears throat> Most interesting though, when I uh, got out of my car in the parking lot, Someone walked up to me and said, you know, you're doing a great job at Lear, and you're doing a lot of great things in the community. <laughs> and I said, thank you, but I think I, I, I'm bald-headed, but I, I, that's Matt Simoncini. <clears throat> he said he's better looking. We'll let you guys be the judge. Um, again, thanks for being here. Just brief introduction uh, of our guests, but I will say about the four of them, uh, because we never have enough time to hit on all of the topics. We want to make sure we get to questions from the audience. But one thing that I will say about all four of the participants today is that if you look at what all of it that they've done career-wise, I think it's all superseded by what they've done in the community and philanthropically, uh, each in their own right. And so I think all four of them are models uh, to all of us who are entrepreneurs, business people, and professionals, uh, that it's possible to really do well and do good at the same time. So I'd like to thank in advance all four of them for that. <clears throat> uh, first, we have Jerry Anderson. Jerry, come up. Chairman and CEO of DTE Energy. Thanks for being with us this morning, Jerry. Good to see you. Cindy Paskey. Founder, President, and CEO of S3. Cindy, good morning. My twin brother, Matthew Simoncini. President, CEO, and a director of Lear Corporation. And last but not least, uh, Dr. William Picard. <laughs> While uh, Doc's uh, title is chairman, please be seated, is uh, chairman of Global Automotive Alliance. Uh, the long list of companies and businesses that he has started and grown, um, the list is too long. But more importantly, he's been a mentor and a friend to my family and my father. So, Doc, thank you. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> jumping into the first question, and in no particular order, Matt, I know you don't have a problem jumping in. Um, <clears throat> you know, what are your thoughts about inclusion in terms of suppliers and employees when it comes to Detroiters? And how do you look, look at, as you're growing your businesses, ensuring that Detroiters get a fair, a fair play? I can start with that. Am I on all right? Hear me? Yeah. So, uh, Okay, in Detroit, I think about inclusion this way. Uh, as our city's revival uh, plays out, as our economic health returns, who's included? Uh, who's lifted up? Who benefits? So, wow. <laughs> I'm surprised you know how to do that. Are you sure you did that? <laughs> <laughs> We're sorry, Jerry. Go ahead. That's all right. Uh, so, you know. Our city in certain parts of the city is on a roll. Everybody knows that. Um, downtown and midtown are rolling. So <clears throat> I think now the, the job for all of us is to turn our attention to reestablishing a healthy, thriving middle class in the city. And if we do that, um, our recovery is inclusive uh, because Detroiters of all walks of life are going to participate. You say, how does a company like ours play into that? So corporations have tools at their disposal. Who do we buy from and where are they? Who do we hire? Where do they come from? Where do we invest in our assets? Our philanthropic giving, what do we support? So I'll just give you a couple of examples of practical ways that we can participate in making the recovery more inclusive. 
where we spend our dollars. So back in 2010, Governor Snyder, when we were in the ditch as a state, came to DTE and said, we really need you to try to buy more from Michigan companies. And so we committed to do that without really knowing what we were committing to. But just to make a long story short, back then we were spending $475 million a year with, <clears throat> with Michigan companies. Today that's $1.3 billion a year. So we've almost tripled it. And I'll tell you, we didn't sacrifice cost or quality. We just had to look harder and find <coughs> Michigan companies who could participate. And our Detroit spend went from $81 million a year to $333 million a year. So when you spend more with Detroit companies, the city gets lifted, the citizens get lifted, and things become more inclusive. Another example is hiring. <clears throat> so uh, by definition, to uh, build a healthy middle class, we've got some hiring to do. And yet Detroit has a serious workforce participation issue. We've got about half of Detroiters participating in the workforce. Uh, that's the problem we need to work on. We also know there's a lot in our community who come with backgrounds that aren't well prepared to participate in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Our companies are set up to go find the best prepared, the best educated, and pull them in. That's our paradigm. So in a lot of ways, we need to invert the paradigm. And as companies, we need to go out and actively seek out people who aren't the best prepared and find a way to work with workforce development agencies to give them the skills and abilities they need to participate successfully. And then we need to ask our own companies to do what we need to do with training and wraparound skill development to allow people to participate successfully. And I know it can work because it's beginning to work at our company. I see it at other companies uh, playing out. But we need this to, to spread broadly uh, in the private <coughs> sector. And I think we need to take this on together as a challenge in the private sector to, to drive this revitalization of middle class. You know, there's kind of no better way to do for others what you want done for you than to give people meaningful work and help them to plug back into supporting society. So, uh, big job, mm -hmm. but, but one I think the private sector can put its shoulder to. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, sure. I, I actually... <coughs> Don't please. This will be like this only. Let's clear my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I actually um, looked up the definition of inclusion mm -hmm. in Webster's Dictionary, and it is a relationship between two classes that exists when all members of the first are also members of the second. I think we need a new word, um, and, and I agree with Jerry. I think that what, what we have to commit to do is, is twofold. Um, we have to find a way to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. um, and and give companies, both corporations and individuals, an opportunity to have access to compete. Um, because what you find is when someone has access to compete and you remove certain barriers that won't impact the quality of your product, the quality of your service, um, you, you find that there are a lot of companies that can bring significant value and place a higher value on the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And then I think you have to be intentional about leveling, leveling the playing field for individuals. So, so to Jerry's point, it's um, when, you, when you look at a position that you have to fill and an opportunity that, that you want to bring someone into your organization, um, how many positions, everyone in this room, how many positions when you hire someone, you already have a set orientation program. You already have set training that someone, whoever you hire, is going to have to go through before they officially start their new role. How difficult would it be to add elements to that orientation and that training so that you can level the playing field for someone who may not have had an opportunity to gather the right level of reading or the right level of math or the right understanding of a particular discipline, mm -hmm. but are willing and will place a value on it? then you have the opportunity to not say we're going to address this definition which says two classes. What you have is an opportunity to recognize everybody as a soul and say what do we, just, what do we need to do to level the playing field? And our experience in 27 years, both when we use suppliers, partners, and when we hire individuals, <coughs> is that they place a higher value on that opportunity to business with you or to work for you or to work for your customer and their performance and effort supersedes any voids that they may start with. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Thank you. Doc, Matt, anything? <clears throat> You're pretty complete. I don't know how you answered that. Well, I think, <clears throat> obviously, the, <clears throat> the inclusion factor it impacts my companies a lot. But, you know, this town is rather unique in a lot of ways because, now, please understand that I started my business when I was eight years old, but 47 years ago, <laughs> 47 years ago, Detroit was one of the first cities in America to permit blacks to own McDonald's within the city limits. So I was able to benefit from that. But more importantly, historically, we've always had these moments in this great city when the community, the business community, and the political leadership came together to afford us unbelievable opportunities. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I make reference to the empowerment zone with Mayor Archer and um, the leadership at General Motors and Johnson Control. And now I see some of that with- You're in Mayor. trouble. <laughs> Never heard I, of I see some of that with Matt. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I see some of that with Matt because Johnson Control no longer exists. <laughs> um, but, but, I, but I think that all of us have to find new ways to be creative. I know we just opened up our national headquarters here in Detroit, and we put it right in the Clark Street area, which used to be the GM Clark Street plant. Now, all I need to do is for the governor and the president to build that damn bridge so we can have access to Canada. Because this is going to, yeah, this is going to be a big part of the resurgence of this community again once we have it, in my opinion, once we have another bridge into Canada. So I think we have a lot of things that are going for us, but I think as um, all of us would agree, the problems are so massive. And they didn't start yesterday, and they didn't start in 1967. This has been happening since 1950s, and we have to double down and double our efforts. <coughs> Thank you. You know, Matt, I will ask you something um, specifically. You know, my business, we're auto suppliers as well, and so I'm dealing with some of the same clients you are. Uh, as well as Dr. Picard. And what we see coming out of global purchasing is the desire to whittle down the number of uh, suppliers and have them be more global in scale. And that sometimes has a negative impact on smaller, um, less regionally diverse minority suppliers. How, how can we answer to the call of our clients and our customers but still not diminish the number of minority and diverse suppliers that we have? Well, that's, you know, that's an incredibly tough equation because on top of it, the piece that you're probably missing is they want it and they want you to sell it to you at less than their cost. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> it's all great. We want it and we want it for free. Uh, we all need to work together and figure out a way to collaborate. I think the key to this is going to be collaboration and development. This is a long road, and as much as we'd like to change it tomorrow, Reality is, in the business we're in, automotive supply and automotive industry, these things take time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's a tough thing to have patience when we've been so behind for so long. The reality is, what it's going to force is real collaboration and involvement. Um, for instance, um, um, Dr. Picard talked about Bridgewater. I think he was alluding to Bridgewater, which is a great organization. In the city of Detroit, we have uh, integrated uh, manufacturing assembly, IMA. We believe in the spirit of diversity <coughs> we hire from the community. It's run by my partner, uh, Jim Comer. Um, and so I think you're, you're going to need to see more like that, like Andre Rush, I don't know if Andre's here today, and Dakota's done an amazing job believing in the spirit of inclusion and diversity as opposed to just putting your name on an entity. That, I think, is the path, because the reality is, I think it's very, very hard for a small, many times privately held organization to put their footprint globally. It's too big of a risk. For me, you know, I didn't weigh in on uh, the first question, because I think my three co-panelists did an outstanding job answering it. To me, it's about building the infrastructure for success. And I know we're going to get on it a little bit later today, but without education, and I don't mean college degrees. I mean, getting these kids through high school with the basic reading and math. I mean, having a bus system that serves on time beyond eight mile, right? We need to put these infrastructures in place to get people to where the jobs are. To me, it's all about jobs. 
right? What made this city great, what made us the Silicon Valley of the 50s and the 60s, what made us consider for the Olympics in 1968 was the fact that we were a growing enterprise and economy with jobs. We need to figure that out because as proud as we are about the resurgence in downtown Detroit, greed has taken over, it'll take care of itself. The neighborhoods will not come back until mm -hmm. we solve the riddle of what is public education. Carol, I believe you have a question, our uh, first, first polling questions. Everyone grab your phones. It's a joy being here with you, Mr. Dennis Archer, ladies and gentlemen of the panel, nice to see you. I'm curious, we've done this pancake so many times, how many are first timers here to the event today? Wow, that's interesting, interesting. All right, so the first question is this, get out all your little mechanisms, we're gonna be voting on this. What key issue should the super CEOs focus on that will make a major impact on Detroit's revitalization? Here are the options. Option A, the high cost of insurance. <coughs> B, regional transit. C, workforce development. And D, neighborhood revitalization. Here's your chance to weigh in. Workforce development. Yeah, workforce development. We've got to have jobs. Yeah, because the vote I'll, 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 I'll read you what the numbers are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Interesting. 52. 55. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to go with this. Jobs. Any more votes? Jobs. Okay, so the high cost of insurance was 5%, regional transit 16%, workforce development 51%, and neighborhood 25%. So, Cindy Paskey, you run a strategic staffing center. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy voted twice. <laughs> what was the question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what key issues should CEOs focus on? No, 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 I get it, I get it. There I get we go. It. Um, I do run for strategic staff in the Live without a net. Yeah. <laughs> and I have to I have to give a shout out. I actually have my entire leadership team from around the world here today. So they spent the night, so thank you guys. Thank you for the great. Um, as you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that, that the mayor has asked Dave Meter and I to co-chair the Mayor's Workforce Development Board and, and I have two of the members sitting next to me on the on the board. Um, Having been in the city by choice for 27 years and grown every year we've been in business, we have 3,500 employees around the world. Um, I look at everything with the answer that all of those other issues can be answered when you create jobs. And when you have jobs and when you can have talent get to jobs if it's not in Detroit. We need to put 100,000 Detroiters to work. Um, in the next five years, we need to put 40,000 Detroiters to work just to start to edge so that Detroit aligns with other cities and the rest of the state on our unemployment. Or, or as, as much as we would like to make to wish it would happen, we're not going to create 100,000 jobs in the city of Detroit. But there are going to be 40,000 jobs that are available. Um, and when someone has a job, um, then they have the ability to <coughs> participate, to lobby, to work with their children, to pay taxes, and all of those other issues have a different path to being addressed. But if we don't have individuals in a situation where they have a job, um, everything else is a non-issue. Then they're worried about basic needs. And the society and the economy both don't move forward. Most of your population is just focused on what their basic need is. You give someone an opportunity, you give them in a job, <coughs> and you give them an opportunity to change their station in life. And then you set the path down to say, the voice that says we want to have regional transit becomes much stronger. The voice that goes to Lansing that says, fix the stupid insurance thing, we're really tired of it, right? They go to Lansing, they know how to communicate. They, they can, it, it, it's completely different. But if you don't start with a job, there's no reason to talk about it. Thanks. So, Matt, Simon, Cindy, you also just mentioned about regional transit, and that did not rank very high amongst the four options there. Um, curious, 
we know the RTA tax vote did not pass last November, so the question is, is, is the, re the issue of regional transit maybe not as important as some people think here? Well, I think it's extremely important. Um, for instance, when Cindy mentioned that, you know, there's a 100,000 um, job deficit in the city of Detroit, I actually think the number might be higher, quite frankly. Uh, not, those, not all those jobs are going to be created in the city of Detroit. They're going to be created in places like Lear. Now, the key to me is getting the um, individuals to the jobs, and if the bus line stops at 8 Mile, I can't get them to 9 and, and Telegraph, and if they get there, uh, they can't get their consistency because the performance of the bus lines <laughs> Um, are not at what they should be on time as opposed to other major uh, metropolitan areas. So I think it's extremely important. To me, uh, it's about the infrastructure we talked about. Part of it is, you know, absolutely education. Uh, getting our students through high school, and for those that aren't college ready, getting them through vocational training, where I think there's a, um, a deficit of of people that are skilled to do jobs like welding and construction and trades and, and what have you. Like an old Italian guy, right? I went through the trial trades and I think those programs have benefit. I think the other piece of the infrastructure is getting the people to the jobs. Now, when I look at job creation, I look at it in two different buckets. First off, um, we all talk about Silicon Valley. I personally believe this town cannot coexist with Silicon Valley. We need to take our birthright back from Silicon Valley. It's our industry. We suffered through the best, worst of times. Now it's the best of times. We're driving the performance that makes Apple and Google want to come to our space. We need to go to Silicon Valley and be competitive and take those jobs back to Detroit. Now, that's... That doesn't speak to the unemployment levels for the residents in the city of Detroit. For those, we have to create an atmosphere working with organized labor, working with the major corporations to figure out how to create an environment to put Detroiters to work. Uh, part of that is getting them the basic reading and math, and part of it is solving the equation to get them where the jobs are at, whether uh, the jobs are in the city of Detroit, or if the jobs are in Southfield, or Bloomfield, or St. Clair Shores, we need to get them there. And part of the education, by the way, not to come back to it, is what kills me in the morning when I drive down Jefferson past the Jefferson Assembly Plant, in the middle of the morning, seeing a young mother holding a child at 6 in the morning in the freezing cold weather, trying to get that baby to health care, possibly going to school, or possibly going to a job, waiting for a bus that may not come. I mean, that's unacceptable. So Dennis, there's a question here from the audience as a follow-up to the new super, the super CEO group. But, uh, this question is this, how concerned are you about the lack of racial diversity is, is another thing. In the city? Mm -hmm. or uh, Amongst these, these, these issues, they were just asking about the lack of, of racial diversity amongst it all, that it, there's not a lot of inclusion. I think if you, if you look at the agenda that's being worked it's all about inclusion. The, the, uh, so that group has been talked about. We, we have been working as a group of leaders. It's not a business agenda. It's, in fact, one of the CEOs explicitly said, I don't want to be here if we're working on our business issues. We can do that in our corporations. So we're here to work on the city's issue. Uh, we started with a fairly <laughs> small group to try to be effective before we expand it. But if you look at the issues, you know, I have a hard time <coughs> disconnecting these issues. They're all the same thing. Uh, high cost of insurance. When you pay $3,500 for insurance, you can't own a car. When you can't own a car, you can't get your kid to school and you can't get to work. Regional transit, you can't get to school, you can't get to work. Right. It makes the community dysfunctional when, when that exists. Workforce development, you can't develop a workforce if you can't get them to school and you can't get them to work. Regional economic development, which is one of our uh, platforms or planks, that's all about workforce development, trying to pull in economic development to, to build jobs. So they're all connected, and if you get behind them all, they really are focused on trying to build, rebuild the health of the middle class of the city, to rebuild jobs in the city and everything that feeds those jobs. So I, you know, I think the biggest definition of inclusion and racial diversity 
is that we're able to pull those things off and it pulls us all back in to, to, a, to good jobs and a functioning community. And when we pull that off, uh, a lot of other things get pulled with it. Carol, I know you have a, a second polling question, but I will say, by way of being uh, chairman of the Detroit Regional Chamber, uh, I've been fortunate enough to sit in Jerry's meetings. And I will say that the, the agenda uh, that this group has put together by mere definition is going to help all Detroiters because they're talking about issues that this is not unlike our chamber. These discussions are not about the 11 county regions. Jerry's discussions are about Detroit specifically. And if you look at the uh, ethnic makeup of the city of Detroit being majority, vastly majority African American and other minorities, I think that the inclusion piece of that uh, is inherent in, in the discussions happening around that table. Carol, you have a second polling question? The second question is this. Get out your little devices and a little rock and roll. What do you think is the number one barrier for people moving into and staying in the city? The options are I or A, high taxes, B, crime, C, lack of job opportunities, or D, schools. So that's A, taxes, B, crime, C, lack of job opportunities, D, schools. And the votes are coming in. Right? <coughs> oh. Okay. got a job, the best okay. in place. So it's taxes is at 5%, crime at 29%, lack of job opportunities 4%, and the winner by a gigantic margin, schools at 69%. So I know, Matt, you talked about DPS and schools and... Uh, Doc, why don't you weigh in about schools, education? Well, I, 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 unfortunately, I told you earlier, I was seven years of age when I went in business. <laughs> and I said eight. Eight, okay. Eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's alternative facts. Anyway, anyway, I, I want to point out one thing, Mr. Chairman, and I think this is critical for me. The black community of Detroit <clears throat> up until 1986 had the highest home ownership in black America. We had the highest savings account in black America and we were some of the strongest black mutual aid societies in America. Now those of you who are too young to remember, 86, 85, 84 was the second wave of the immigration of forward cars to this country and we had to shrink drastically the big three. So I go back again, I think it was Sydney. Mm -hmm. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Now you gotta get to the job, you gotta go transportation wise, you gotta go to school, but let's focus on one thing. This community, this black community, which is 85% of this community, has not <coughs> always been a Lord have mercy community. We were the strongest black community in America. We had the highest home ownership and we had the highest savings. So again, I think there are a lot of things that feed into this job syndrome, but when people have opportunities, even the new generation of younger blacks, when there's a job available that was a reasonable pay, I believe a lot of these other concerns are important, but they're not as important. I just want to put a pin in that. We once were the strongest link in the African American community in North America. And I don't want us to forget that because sometimes we think we've always been in this kind of situation. That is not true. Up until 1986, 87, we were the leaders of black America here in Detroit, Flint, Saginaw, and Pontiac because of the jobs that were available primarily at the big three. Anyone else want to weigh on the issue of taxes versus crime versus job opportunities versus schools? Oh. May I, uh, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Dr. Picard about uh, but Bill, Matt. We're Bill. going to do a deal, right? <laughs> yeah, we are going to do that. We're going to do a deal, call me Bill. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad you're not a proctologist. <laughs> uh, look, if you think about it for a minute, 
um, in the city of Detroit, if we, if we could center our neighborhoods around high performing high schools with five grade schools feeding it, I think the neighborhoods will cluster around those schools, right? It's very much like Europeans did in centuries ago around the churches in their community. We need to stop treating kids like $7,500 price tags and letting these schools compete for them with no oversight whatsoever on where schools are going. <laughs> Whether you believe in the charter school as a supplement to Detroit Public Schools or what have you, we have basically 12 or 13 independent school systems operating in the city of Detroit with no traffic cop determining. So we have communities that are overserved, we have communities that are underserved, we don't have a level playing field where there's all have to do high schools, where kids that are transient or low performers are accepted equally. This is unacceptable. We had this giant coalition that was put together. We had Republicans, Democrats, public, private, you know, all working together to find a solution. And it didn't get passed through in its entirety, and I find that unacceptable. This problem is owned by the governor. This problem is owned by the state. Mayor Duggan has asked for the authority to oversight it. I think we need to give it to him, and I think that would go a long way to improving the neighborhoods because if you're young and newly married or single living in the city of Detroit, once you have kids, the decision you have to make is where do I send them? Do I pay money for a private school, if you can find one they can walk to or even get to, right? Do you pay money or do you just put it in your home where you have an opportunity to, to, to go to school for free in places like Gross Point or St. Clair Shores? And, and to me, we've got to solve that riddle because then the neighborhoods would come back. And kids need to be able to walk to school in their neighborhood. That's the American way. Good point. <laughs> So uh, we have some audience questions. Reminder, on the uh, tables there, you'll have index cards. If you have questions, feel free to fill them in. Olga is over here collecting them. If you have any questions to suggest, get them to Olga. Um, we have an audience question here. Good morning, Milan Stevanovich with the Detroit Chinese Business Association and the Council for Ethnic Chambers. I'd like to thank uh, DT Energy for being one of our gold sponsors and the advisory board seat at our organization. Um, my humble opinion is what can we do to become more internationally welcome to get more foreign direct investment into the city? Well, there's, there's one playing out real time right now. Uh, it's, it's been all over the news uh, in terms of not only the state but Detroit competing for a major new manufacturing operation. That deal for Detroit would be seismic. It uh, would diversify us, it would create thousands of jobs. Uh, those are the sorts of things we need to be good at competing for. A couple of things are needed uh, at the state level. Um, I'm sorry, but everybody else is using tools that we in Michigan aren't. They're using incentives. I know we had a bad experience with incentives in Michigan. We need to figure out how to do that the right way. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, we're going to be in the conversation we're in today, which is Wisconsin's put $100 million on the table. And in Lansing, we're trying to figure out in committees whether we're even willing to talk about the subject. Uh, the long-term benefits of that facility are huge and we need to figure out uh, where we're going to play in terms of tools to attract development. Regionally, we don't have our act together uh, on regional economic development. Uh, we're too fractured and competitive. Now we've improved, uh, but we are not where the best regions are in terms of having a single point of entry that's mm -hmm. got the information and knows how to direct uh, uh, potential investors in our region to the right places, the right properties in a quick, efficient way. Uh, we're scrambled compared to the best regions. So one of the priorities that I know a number of us are working is to try to, to clean that process up and be much better at it. So both at the state and the regional level, we've got some work to do. Anyone else want to weigh in on that question? We need, uh, we need tax reform. We need it in the country, <coughs> we need it in the state. We need to be competitive from a tax structure standpoint. So if we go state to state, uh, we need to be the most efficient with our tax structure to encourage people to come here. I think we have a ready workforce that we can supply the jobs. I actually absolutely believe in that. Um, but I think if you talk about first bringing jobs to the U.S., our tax code is antiquated. 
It's complicated and it's too costly and it doesn't compete with other countries. It just doesn't. We need to reform, we need to demand reform there. From a state standpoint, you're still highly taxed, whether you have incentives or not. The ongoing tax structure is not competitive and I think we need to address that. And then the final piece of it, Jerry's right, when um, you're opening a facility anywhere in the world, we have a one-stop shop typically in countries where we go in and they ease your passage through all the bureaucracy, state, local, or you know, local municipalities to the, to the federal. We don't have that here. We don't have that Office of Business Development that's going to cut all the red tape and we definitely don't have an incentive package. I mean, the film thing, man, it was great. It was exciting to see things blowing up here and there and stuff, you know, but <laughs> it didn't really, it wasn't sustainable. It didn't really create any ongoing jobs because it was one and done. You did it, the production filmed, and they were gone. If we get a company like Foxconn to come here, that's going to be here for a long time. And, you know, we've got to get it done. We need to demand that it gets done. Well, and I, and I think we have to recognize that the, the, the job creation it would be a really good thing to have companies come from other countries and choose Detroit and choose Michigan. And so often, we the only dialogue or discussion we have is about an individual that's trying to come and, and live in our city or live in our country. We need to raise that dialogue up and say, we want to compete for the job creators around the world. We have the airport. We're a border city. We have the waterways. Why aren't we all sending out the message that says you can be from anywhere in the world. If you're going to come here and you're going to create jobs in our city, in our state, we will welcome you. By default, when that happens and jobs are created, there's a change in dialogue in the immigration question, right? Because there's a change in view and there's a change in impact. But we very rarely let that conversation be, what are we doing to find the job creators around the world and the corporations and saying, you are actually welcome here. What do we need to do to get you here? Dennis, I'd like to dovetail on the, the way Michigan has all these different agencies. We do quite a bit of business in Alabama and South Carolina. It's one-stop shop. Right. One stop. Right. They take care of everything from zoning to subsidies and what have you. And it's a lot easier path of entry. Yeah, this, this may sound like an arcane issue, but if you're a company trying to get into a region and you've got three that are fairly even-handed, and one is a complicated, difficult process to find your way through, go to the two that are just as good somewhere else that makes it easy for you. Okay. So we've got to get our act together. We have another audience question here from <coughs> Terry Barkley of Inforum. It's, she just ran an incredible event with Dr. Mae Jemison, the first African-American woman in space, who gave it was inspirational, the speech she gave in helping young girls get into STEM and other sorts of things like that. So she has a question. I'm kind of probably guess what it has to do with. <laughs> um, actually, um, Jerry, you said something that I found really interesting because it resonated. You know, informs all about accelerating careers for women and boosting talent initiatives for companies. And one of the things that re the research shows is that to shift the, the story, it's all about shifting the paradigm, the hiring paradigm in particular. And what you said, um, all the research shows if you broaden the search, it's all about broadening the search for talent. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, I see companies so often, they're very clear about the talent that they need, but they keep going sort of to the same sources to look for it. And if they want a broader, richer pool, I think they have to start to shift their own thinking about that. And you referenced that at the beginning. I'd be really curious. I've worked with all of you. And by the way, kudos and thank you to all of you for your commitment to our city and our community. But what do you see as being the key to shifting the mindset about the talent search? Well, I'll start, and I'm, I'm sure others have thoughts. But I mentioned at the outset the governor asking us to buy more from Michigan companies. Look, we had our system set up. We thought we had the most efficient companies who bid uh, routinely uh, to DTE. And when the governor asked, I thought, you know, how do I change that and remain efficient? What we found is there were a lot of Michigan companies who didn't understand us. Large companies, small companies, who could participate but didn't know how to. And we had to reach out and find them, educate them, and change the way we were pulling in suppliers. 
And at first, that was more work. But I got to tell you now, it's just business. It's just the way things are done. It's efficient, it works, they're included in the system, and as a result, we're spending three times as much in Michigan and four times as much in Detroit. And I got to tell you, I did tell people we're not going <coughs> to sacrifice cost or quality to, to make this happen. People have got to meet the bar, but they have. But it required us to look differently. So I think hiring is similar. We all have HR processes. They're set up in a certain way. They've got screens for people who come in. And it's predictable who's going to make it through the set of screens. Unless we think about how to change that inbound process, similar to the way we thought through how to bring in more suppliers, we're going to keep getting the same result. So when I said invert the paradigm, we're going to actively, we're going to need to actively look for people who are not coming in with what our current screening system uh, brings into the company. That means we're going to go look out for people who come from challenged backgrounds. Somebody mentioned Andre Rush. Andre is one example, but there are many. One of them's here. Uh, people from challenged backgrounds make fantastic employees because they're looking uh, for the second lease on life. And so we just need to find a way to uh, work with agencies who can skill people up and skill them up in our own companies. I don't think that's a huge investment. Training, extra training is not that big a deal. Uh, but we need to figure out that process of, of having a, a bigger and a different funnel into our company. Right. I, I agree. And thank you, Jerry. I think that the, the first thing that you have to start with is you have to recognize that talent acquisition is different than your HR functions. So that's the, the very first place you draw the line. Okay. HR should, should protect both the company and the individual. Um, but when you, when you separate out talent acquisition and you look at it just how are we going to bring the talent in, where is the talent going to come from, um, and, and map out your process. And to Jerry's point, um, so many of you are going to have an automated process that excludes so much talent, um, whether it's a veteran, right? How many people have seen a veteran CV? 36% right? of our population around the United States are veterans. Their CVs, resumes, will never match and will never make it past your automatic screen unless someone has rewritten it for them. Um, someone who is going to value the opportunity and looking for a chance to change their station in life, um, there's not going to be anything that they can put on that resume that will match your automatic screen. But if you separate out your talent acquisition and you say, what are we going to do to remove these barriers, change how we screen, um, you will find that there is so much talent available that the answer is right in front of you. But, but Jerry's right, you've got you to flip it completely upside down. Um, and the, the things that you used, and then I'll finish, the things that you used to drive efficiency in your hiring process that you were thought were so good, you're going to automate this, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, we're going to save all this money, we're going to eliminate all those people. And guess what? You can't fill your jobs. And you know what? Your cost of hire goes up. Every single month, you can't fill a job. So you've undone all of those cost savings. You just put it in a different bucket. You put that cost in a different bucket. You still, if hiring people is hiring people. You have to, and, and we're an IT services company, right? Take some of the technology out of it, and you will fill your jobs. The people are there. Dying. body language, what people are saying. I know you're dying to ask a question, but before you do, I have one quick question here about something that's very important to not just our city, but the region and the state. Excuse me. Good morning. My name is Mark S. Lee, and uh, I have my own consulting business here in the Detroit area. I'm also a Cranes Detroit blogger, and I focus on small business in Cranes when I blog for them. And I also have a radio show. I host Small Talk with Mark S. Lee on CBS Detroit's WXYT. So my question uh, to Dr. Picard in particular, uh, you know, we know you started your business when you were three years old. Uh, <laughs> or five years ago. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but what I'm going with this, according to the U.S. Uh, 2012 U.S. Census data, the city of Detroit has over 62,000 small businesses. We are the fourth largest city in the country when it comes to entrepreneurship. Uh, then when you look at the fact that uh, Wayne County is the second largest in the country when it comes to women-owned businesses. So entrepreneurship certainly plays a vital role. We cannot pick up a newspaper today without uh, certainly talking about entrepreneurship. So my question is very simple. 
What has what have been your keys to success, entrepreneurship over the last forty seven plus years? What, you know, kind of talk to the audience about how you've been successful. Doc, I know you could go on for the next forty five minutes. You just wrote a book, which you kindly gave out to the pancakes two pancakes ago. But is there some quick lessons you can share with people here on that? Well, I think uh, there's a magic moment in almost every community, every company, every culture. And I hit Detroit at a moment when people were willing to help. Um, we still have some of that today. Uh, I was just fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time. But I think Jerry said something. How hungry are you? How bad do you want it? And I don't think that's based on race or gender. I think there are a lot of people out here in our communities who really, really want a chance. And we have to find those people and help those people to get into the process. And I'm excited about the future of Detroit, but I would love to see jobs and ownership working together a lot more. But I think we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. You know, <clears throat> for the past several years, um, we've heard a lot about uh, cybersecurity data protection. Uh, recent events of this week bring it really back home as it relates to self-preservation uh, and perhaps uh, safety uh, and protection in the workplace. How have you all, and there's hundreds of thousands of jobs that are represented on the stage with global footprints, how do you go about uh, stepping up both your cyber security, as we can see from the recent hacks, there's, a, there's an uptick in, in attacks on our corporate infrastructure, but also making sure that your people around the world are safe. So, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, I never thought, you know, six years ago when I made CEO, that Lear would have a division on cybersecurity, um, both for our product and our internally. And we do now. It's it's the way of the world. We have to, I and mean, we have to ensure that our products um, can't be hacked. But we also need to understand that our 150,000 employees that have connections need to understand the, the risks, the do's and the don'ts. And so it's it's a constant communication. Um, there's not a day that goes by that there's not an issue. Um, when we track the attacks. Um, it's, it's um, online. You can see the lines just constantly coming in. I think in any given day we might have a couple thousand attempts to break into our systems. That's just the way of the world. I, I mean, um, and I think the risk is there. The risk is real as individuals. I mean, I think the vast majority of people in this room have had some issue with, you know, identity theft or, or um, you know, your PC being hacked or what have you or a virus on your PC. From a business, it's huge. Um, we need to invest in that. And I actually think now flipping the tables, there's an opportunity. Because right now, um, you know, with U of M, University of Michigan, they have the leading, um, one of the leading in the countries and probably in the world um, divisions on cyber. That's an opportunity because that's something that, for instance, would be great to center here in the Detroit area mm -hmm. with um, the younger <coughs> population that are well versed in uh, the tools of hacking, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> so uh, I'd add to that just saying that there's two sectors that the federal government is really worried about in terms of cybersecurity. One is banking, the other is energy. And it doesn't take long to figure out why they'd worry about energy because if electricity is shut down, everything is shut down. So we are, uh, we are connected to the alphabet soup of federal agencies, quarterbacked by Homeland Security, with constant inbound from them on threats and threat levels. There are people in my company with clearances that I don't have to hear information on, on what's happening uh, with, with the sort of threats that Matt is talking about. There was a breach in the Ukraine of the electric system. Uh, and one of the things that's been learned is it isn't just cyber, as in coming in through the internet. It's physical, as in people infiltrating your organizations to perpetrate cybersecurity. And for a business like ours, uh, physical security and cybersecurity get totally wound up together. We've got to be hyper vigilant uh, in this country in the energy sector. Banking, too. If they ever take down the banking system, 
uh, the economy is in a real hurt. Uh, so, but when you're when you're close to a sector that's uh, dealing with this at a very high level, it's intense. <clears throat> Cindy, how concerned are you now as you deploy resources across the globe? And you bring somebody in, you say, hey, we're going to send you to Europe, we're going to send you to Asia to go work. How concerned are you? Uh, are you any more concerned about those people's security than you were, say, five years ago? No, absolutely. Thank you, Dennis. And I mean, and you know, I mean, we've been in, in Lithuania since 1999, mm -hmm. right? So um, very westward-facing country, large operation for us. Um, Montes can tell you a story. I was quoted in the Lithuanian business section with my picture being who I am, making a comment about Putin. And like two weeks later, these Russian business owners show up in our office wanting to see if they can figure out how to do business with us. Yeah. So, it, I mean, and we're not a DTE, we're not a Lear, I mean, we're not, we're, you know, we're working on our way to a billion dollars, but we're not there. Um, so we're always concerned, and we, we, the way we travel, um, the way we ensure, you know, if, if we're, someone's going to Europe, we don't want them in their own car, we want them with a driver. Um, and we're not a billion dollar company, but there's nothing more important than the safety of our employees. Um, I can tell you from a technology standpoint, it certainly helps that we've been in that part of the world so long um, and, the, and the engagements that we've had. Um, and it also helps that we have such a large military veteran population. Mm -hmm. um, but we take it very, very seriously. And, um, you know, there, there are things that people don't want to talk about, but there are countries you go in the world where everybody sells the list of who's on those planes before they get off the plane, mm -hmm. and what their company is and what their background is, and that hasn't changed. So part of what you have to do is you have to recognize all of the things that do happen mm -hmm. and are out there, and it can't be perfect, but you can't pretend that's not going to happen. And then you have to say it's worth the investment of cost that we always have someone picked up at the airport. They always have to check in. Shreem will tell you this. Everyone travels internationally. They have to check in all the particular points. What kind of hotel do you stay in? Do you know the owner? You know, mm -hmm. in parts of Europe, we know all the owners of the hotels. Partly because we are that multi-billion dollar company, so it, we, we have to take, I think, extra measures because it would be easier to single us mm -hmm. out, right? And we're very, very intentional about it. But then it's, for those of us who are not these big multi-billion dollar companies, uh, we were able to pick up a veteran who was very, very well-versed well in cyber, cybersonics. And we hired him three years ago, and he has really brought things to our companies, as small as we are, that we were never even aware of. So I think it's something that almost every company will have to deal with, <coughs> domestically or internationally. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from the audience, but one theme that I'm seeing that you all are probably hearing up here that I would ask everyone to pay attention to is the value of the veteran workforce community. And I think we've heard a number of anecdotes on stage this morning about how they bring a uh, specific and different sort of resource and talent uh, to the workplace. So I would encourage everyone to consider that. Yeah, we had uh, problems in 1981 when 12 kids were going up and down the stores grabbing bottles of wine and liquor and running away. And uh, we decided to do something about it because two uh, kids and one store owner were shot and killed. So we uh, decided to, with the help of Tom Fox and Jerry Blocker, we decided to form Metro Detroit Youth Day to inspire our kids to do the most good. So. On July 12th, we'll have 37,000 kids at, at the athletic field in Belle Isle, which was uh, barely hardly anybody on it at those times. Today it's flourishing. And uh, we are going to have all kinds of activities. We're going to give out 110 college scholarships. We're going to do a lot of things. We wonder what some of you might be doing to help inspire our kids. Oh, well, well yeah, that's, I know this could be a yeah. whole talk show right yeah. from here. Cindy, <laughs> you get the last word on that. Though. Yeah, okay. Well, we, we love you, Ed. You're great. And um, you're doing an amazing thing. 
Everyone in the room who's taking a student from Brody Trace Young Talent, raise your hand right now. And if you're not, call us, help us. That's the most important thing I think we can do this summer, right? Yeah, is, is take what the mayor and his team have started, and it's now 8,000 students. We're committed at the mayor's office, at the CEO level, at the Downtown Detroit Partnership to continue to improve that program, to have stages of jobs for the young people. The most important thing you can do for young people in the city of Detroit this summer is give them an opportunity to be part of Grow Detroit Young Town. I know all of you have more you want to say about this, but I know we're running short of time here, and I know that Denny has a last question. But before we wind it down, um, as longtime attendees of this, these forums know it's been my pleasure to serve as moderator of these events for, gosh, has it been 12 years? It seems like only yesterday we started here. While my professional portfolio of opportunities isn't going to afford me the time to be involved with this going forward, just know I look forward to being involved in assisting in other ongoing dialogue of Southeast Michigan, the resurgence of our city, which we all love so much, and other similar <coughs> venues in the future. Um, but before I depart, I just want to give a huge heartfelt shout out to the late Sam Logan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> which, as we all know, look around the room, has become a staple in the community. Um, long before there was digital media and real times media, there was Sam Logan, who was here for decades and decades, whose footprint across Southeast Michigan, his trailblazing ways will never be forgotten. I wish Hiram, Kathy, Olga, and all the others involved with this continued success. I look forward to seeing how this evolves, and it's been my honor. <laughs> So as we close, there's been a lot of discussion about education and leading into workforce. We have a new CEO uh, that is going to be running or is now running uh, our public school system. Um, you get one piece of advice each to give to our new CEO. Uh, what is it? Well, as a company that, that has lots of great jobs to offer uh, in the skilled trades, put the career and technical education system in the city back on its feet. It's mm -hmm. more abundant today, and it needs to be put back on its feet. Thank you. Cindy? Um, I agree with that, and um, you know, I, I know this is difficult, but we all do it in our jobs. Actually be accessible when someone makes a phone call. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. don't know what you don't know, and they can't help you if you don't return your calls. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Matt? Uh, the problems are, are fixable. I'm not sure the problems are fixable with political will. So you have to be uh, willing not to be popular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and our entrepreneur that started at age eight, Dr. McCarr. <laughs> Six. <I'm> going down. <laughs> <laughs> Create a culture that say children can achieve. Let me just say, uh, we're trying to get you out of here on time. It's been a pleasure uh, to have served as moderator this morning. I think this was a great discussion. And as you are aware, this series of Pancakes and Politics uh, is a four-part series uh, that starts in March. So this is the last one for the year. Uh, but I think that you've heard a lot on stage today that should, A, give you pause, and B, uh, hopefully you leave getting in your car figuring out what you can do to help. Because a lot of work to do in the community, and there's a lot of different uh, areas that you can all get involved that you've heard about today. So thank you and enjoy your day. <laughs> that was great.